Section 0 of Selections from Fear and Trembling, translated by Lee M. Hollander. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. Section 0 Fear and Trembling, Introduction 2 not only in the world of commerce, but also in the world of ideas, our age has arranged a regular clearance sale. Everything may be had at such absurdly low prices that very soon the question will arise whether anyone cares to bid. Every waiter with a speculative turn who carefully marks the significant progress of modern philosophy, every lecturer in philosophy, every tutor, student, every sticker and quitter of philosophy, they are not content with doubting everything, but go right on. It might possibly be ill-timed and inopportune to ask them whether they are bound, but it is no doubt polite and modest to take it for granted that they have doubted everything. Else it were a curious statement for them to make, that they were proceeding onwards. So they have, all of them, completed that preliminary operation, and it would seem, with such ease, that they do not even think it necessary to waste a word about how they did it. The fact is, not even he who looked anxiously and with a troubled spirit for some little point of information ever found one, nor any instruction, nor even any little didactic prescription, as to how one is to accomplish this enormous task. But did not Descartes proceed in this fashion? Descartes, indeed, that venerable, humble, honest thinker, whose writings surely no one can read without deep emotion. Descartes did what he said, and said what he did. Alas, alas, that is a mighty rare thing in our times. But Descartes, as he says frequently enough, never uttered doubts concerning his faith. In our times, as was remarked, no one is content with faith, but goes right on. The question is whether they are proceeding may be a silly question, whereas it is a sign of urbanity and culture to assume that everyone has faith, to begin with, for else it were a curious statement for them to make, that they are proceeding further. In the olden days it was different. Then faith was a task for the whole lifetime, because it held that proficiency in faith was not to be won within a few days or weeks. Hence, when the tried patriarch felt his end approaching after having fought his battles and preserved his faith, he was still young enough at heart not to have forgotten the fear and trembling which disciplined his youth, and which the mature man has under control, but which no one entirely outgrows, except in so far as he succeeds in going on, as early as possible. The goal which those venerable men reached at last, at that spot everyone starts, in our times, in order to proceed further. Section 1 Preparation Recording by Shreya Sethi There lived a man who, when a child, had heard the beautiful Bible story of how God tempted Abraham, and how he stood the test, how he maintained his faith, and against his expectations received his son back again. As this man grew older, he read the same story with ever greater admiration, for now life had separated what had been united in the reverent simplicity of the child. And the older he grew, the more frequently his thoughts reverted to that story. His enthusiasm waxed stronger and stronger, and yet the story grew less and less clear to him. Finally, he forgot everything else in thinking about it, and his soul contained but one wish, which was to behold Abraham, and but one longing, which was to have been witness to that event. His desire was not to see the beautiful hands of the Orient, and not the splendor of the promised land, and not the reverend couple whose old age the Lord had blessed with children, and not the venerable figure of the aged patriarch, and not the God-given vigorous youth of Isaac, it would have been the same to him if the event had come to pass on some barren heath. But his wish was to have been with Abraham on the three days' journey when he rode with sorrow before him and with Isaac at his side. His wish was to have been present at the moment when Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw Mount Moriah afar off, to have been present at the moment when he left his asses behind and wended his way up to the mountain alone with Isaac. For the mind of this man was busy 
not with the delicate conceits of the imagination, but rather with his shuddering thought. The man we speak of was no thinker. He felt no desire to go beyond his fate. It seemed to him the most glorious fate to be remembered as the father of faith and a most enviable lot to be possessed of that faith, even if no one knew it. The man we speak of was no learned exegist. He did not even understand Hebrew. Who knows? But a knowledge of Hebrew might have helped him to understand readily both the story and Abraham. 1. And God tempted Abraham and said unto him, Take Isaac, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and go to the land Moriah, and sacrifice him there on a mountain, which I shall show thee. It was in the early morning, Abraham arose betimes, and had his asses saddled. He departed from his tent, and Isaac with him, but Sarah looked out of the window after them until they were out of sight. Silently they rode for three days, but on the fourth morning Abraham said not a word, but lifted up his eyes and beheld Mount Moriah in the distance. He left his servants behind, and leading Isaac by the hand, he approached the mountain. But Abraham said to himself, I shall surely conceal from Isaac whither he is going. He stood still, he laid his hand on Isaac's head to bless him, and Isaac bowed down to receive his blessing. And Abraham's aspect was fatherly, his glance was mild, his speech admonishing, but Isaac understood him not. His soul would not rise to him. He embraced Abraham's knees, he besought him at his feet, he begged for his young life, for his beautiful hopes. He recalled the joy in Abraham's house when he was born. He reminded him of the sorrow and the loneliness that would be after him. Then did Abraham rise up the youth and lead him by his hand, and his words were full of consolation and admonishment. But Isaac understood him not. He ascended Mount Moriah, but Isaac understood him not. Then Abraham averted his face for a moment, but when Isaac looked again, his father's countenance was changed, his glance wild, his aspect terrible. He seized Isaac and threw him to the ground and said, Thou foolish lad, believest thou I am thy father, an idol worshipper am I? Believest thou it is God's command? Nay, but my pleasure. Then Isaac trembled and cried out in his fear, God in heaven, have pity on me. God of Abraham, show mercy to me. I have no father on earth. Be thou then my father. But Abraham said softly to himself, Father in heaven, I thank thee. Better is it that he believes me inhuman than that he should lose his faith in thee. When the child is to be weaned, his mother blackens her breast, for it were a pity if her breast should look sweet to him when he is not to have it. Then the child believes that her breast has changed, but his mother is ever the same. Her glance is full of love and as tender as ever. Happy he who needed not worse means to wean his child. 2. It was in the early morning. Abraham arose betimes and embraced Sarah, the bride of his old age. And Sarah kissed Isaac, who had taken the shame from her. Isaac her pride, her hope for all coming generations. Then the twain rode silently along their way, and Abraham's glance was fastened on the ground before him, until on the fourth day, when he lifted up his eyes and beheld Mount Moriah in the distance, but then his eyes again sought the ground. Without a word, he put the faggots in order and bound Isaac, and without a word, he unsheathed his knife. Then he beheld the ram God had chosen, and sacrificed him, and wended his way home. From that day on, Abraham grew old. He could not forget that God had required this of him. Isaac flourished as before, but Abraham's eye was darkened. He saw happiness no more. When the child has grown and is to be weaned, his mother will, in maidenly fashion, conceal her breast. Then the child has a mother no longer. Happy the child, 
who lost not his mother in any other sense. 3. It was in the early morning, Abraham arose betimes, he kissed Sarah, the young mother, and Sarah kissed Isaac, her joy, her delight for all times, and Abraham rode on his way, lost in thought. He was thinking of Hagar and her son, whom he had driven out into the wilderness. He ascended Mount Moriah, and he drew the knife. It was a calm evening when Abraham rode out alone, and he rode to Mount Moriah. There he cast himself down on his face and prayed to God to forgive him his sin in that he had been about to sacrifice his son Isaac and in that the father had forgotten his duty toward his son. And yet oftener he rode on his lonely way, but he found no rest. He could not grasp that it was a sin that he had wanted to sacrifice to God his most precious possession, him for whom he would most gladly have died many times. But if it was a sin, if he had not loved Isaac thus, then could he not grasp the possibility that he could be forgiven? For what sin more terrible? When the child is to be weaned, the mother is not without sorrow that she and her child are to be separated more and more, that the child, who had first lain under her heart, and afterwards at any rate rested at her breast, is to be so near to her no more. So they sorrow together for that brief while. Happy he who kept his child so near to him and needed not to sorrow more. 4. It was in the early morning. All was ready for the journey in the house of Abraham. He bade farewell to Sarah and Eliezer. His faithful servant accompanied him along the way for a little while. They rode together in peace, Abraham and Isaac, until they came to Mount Moriah, and Abraham prepared everything for the sacrifice, calmly and mildly. But when his father turned aside in order to unsheath his knife, Isaac saw that Abraham's left hand was knit in despair, and that a trembling shook his frame. But Abraham drew forth the knife. Then they returned home again. And Sarah hastened to meet them, but Isaac had lost his faith. No one in all the world ever said a word about this. Nor did Isaac speak to any man concerning what he had seen, and Abraham suspected not that anyone had seen it. When the child is to be weaned, the mother has the stronger food ready, lest the child perish. Happy he who has in readiness the stronger food. Thus, and in many similar ways thought the man whom I have mentioned above this event, and every time he returned after a pilgrimage to Mount Moriah, he sank down in weariness, folding his hands and saying, No one in truth was great as was Abraham, and who can understand him? Section 2 a Panegyric on Abraham Recording by Eduardo If a consciousness of the eternal were not implanted in man, if the basis of all that exists were but a confusedly fermenting element which, convulsed by obscure passions, produced all, both the great and the insignificant, if under everything there lay a bottomless void never to be filled, what else were life? but despair. If it were thus, and if there were no sacred bonds between man and man, if one generation arose after another, as in the forest, the leaves of one season succeed the leaves of another, or like the songs of birds which are taken up one after another. If the generations of man passed through the world like a ship passing through the sea and the wind over the desert, a fruitless and vain thing. If eternal oblivion were ever greedily watching for its prey, and there existed no power strong enough to wrest it from its clutches. How empty were life then, and how dismal! And therefore it is not thus. But, just as God created man and woman, he likewise called into being the hero and the poet or orator. The latter cannot perform the deeds of the hero. He can only admire and love him and rejoice in him. And yet he also is happy and not less so, for the hero is, 
as it were, his better self with which he has fallen in love, and he is glad he is not himself the hero, so that his love can express itself in admiration. The poet is the genius of memory, and does nothing but recall what has been done, can do nothing but admire what has been done. He adds nothing of his own, but he is jealous of what has been entrusted to him. He obeys the choice of his own heart, but once he has found what he has been seeking, he visits every man's door with his song and with his speech, so that all may admire the hero as he does, and be proud of the hero as he is. This is his achievement, his humble work. This is his faithful service in the house of the hero. If thus, faithful to his love, he battles day and night against the guile of oblivion which wishes to lure the hero from him, then has he accomplished his task. Then is he gathered to his hero who loves him as faithfully. For the poet is, as it were, the hero's better self, unsubstantial, to be sure, like a mere memory, but also transfigured as is a memory. Therefore shall no one be forgotten who has done great deeds, and even if there be delay, even if the cloud of misunderstanding obscure the hero from our vision, still his lover will come some time, and the more time has passed, the more faithfully will he cleave to him. No, no one shall be forgotten who was great in this world, but each hero was great in his own way, and each one was eminent in proportion to the great things he loved. For he who loved himself became great through himself, and he who loved others became great through his devotion. But he who loved God became greater than all of these. Every one of them shall be remembered, but each one became great in proportion to his trust. One became great by hoping for the possible, another by hoping for the eternal. But he who hoped for the impossible, he became greater than all of these. Every one shall be remembered, but each one was great in proportion to the power with which he strove. For he who strove with the world became great by overcoming himself, but he who strove with God, he became the greatest of them all. Thus there have been struggles in the world, man against man, one against a thousand. But he who struggled with God, he became greatest of them all. Thus there was fighting on this earth, and there was he who conquered everything by his strength, and there was he who conquered God by his weakness. There was he who, trusting in himself, gained all, and there was he who, trusting in his strength, sacrificed everything, but he who believed in God was greater than all of these. There was he who was great through his strength, and he who was great through his wisdom, and he who was great through his hopes, and he who was great through his love. But Abraham was greater than all of these, great through the strength whose power is weakness, great through the wisdom whose secret is folly, great through the hope whose expression is madness, great through the love which is hatred of one's self. Through the urging of his faith, Abraham left the land of his forefathers and became a stranger in the land of promise. He left one thing behind and took one thing along. He left his worldly wisdom behind and took with him faith. For else he would not have left the land of his fathers, but would have thought it an unreasonable demand. Through his faith he came to be a stranger in the land of promise, where there was nothing to remind him of all that had been dear to him, but where everything by its newness tempted his soul to longing. And yet was he God's chosen, he in whom the Lord was well pleased. Indeed, had he been one cast off, one thrust out of God's mercy, then might he have comprehended it. But now it seemed like a mockery of him and of his faith. There have been others who lived in exile from the fatherland which they loved, they are not forgotten, nor is the song of lament forgotten in which they mournfully sought and found what they had lost. Of Abraham there exists no song of lamentation. It is human to complain, it is human to weep with the weeping, but it is greater to believe and more blessed to consider him who has faith. Through his faith Abraham received the promise that in his seed were to be blessed all races of mankind. Time passed. There was still the possibility of it, and Abraham had faith. Another man there was who also lived in hopes. Time passed, the evening of his life was approaching. 
Neither was he paltry enough to have forgotten his hopes, neither shall he be forgotten by us. Then he sorrowed, and his sorrow did not deceive him, as life had done, but gave him all it could. For in the sweetness of sorrow he became possessed of his disappointed hopes. It is human to sorrow, it is human to sorrow with the sorrowing, but it is greater to have faith, and more blessed to consider him who has faith. No song of lamentation has come down to us from Abraham. He did not sadly count the days as time passed. He did not look at Sarah with suspicious eyes, whether she was becoming old. He did not stop the sun's course, lest Sarah should grow old and his hope with her. He did not lull her with his songs of lamentation. Abraham grew old, and Sarah became a laughingstock to the people. And yet was he God's chosen, and heir to the promise that in his seed were to be blessed all races of mankind. Were it, then, not better if he had not been God's chosen? For what is it to be God's chosen? Is it to have denied to one in one's youth all the wishes of youth in order to have them fulfilled after great labor in old age? But Abraham had faith and steadfastly lived in hope. Had Abraham been less firm in his trust, then would he have given up that hope, he would have said to God, So it is, perchance, not thy will, after all, that this shall come to pass. I shall surrender my hope. It was my only one. It was my bliss. I am sincere. I conceal no secret grudge for that thou didst deny it to me. He would not have remained forgotten. His example would have saved many a one. But he would not have become the father of faith. For it is great to surrender one's hope but greater still to abide by it steadfastly after having surrendered it. For it is great to seize hold of the eternal hope, but greater still to abide steadfastly by one's worldly hopes after having surrendered them. Then came the fullness of time. If Abraham had not had faith, then Sarah would probably have died of sorrow, and Abraham, dulled by his grief, would not have understood the fulfillment but would have smiled about it as a dream of his youth. But Abraham had faith, and therefore he remained young. For he who always hopes for the best, him life will deceive, and he will grow old. And he who is always prepared for the worst, he will soon age. But he who has faith, he will preserve eternal youth. Praise therefore be to this story. For Sarah, though advanced in age, was young enough to wish for the pleasures of a mother, and Abraham, though gray of hair, was young enough to wish to become a father. In a superficial sense, it may be considered miraculous that what they wished for came to pass, but in a deeper sense, the miracle of faith is to be seen in Abraham's and Sarah's being young enough to wish, and their faith having preserved their wish and therewith their youth. The promise he had received was fulfilled, and he accepted it in faith, and it came to pass according to the promise and his faith, whereas Moses smote the rock with his staff, but believed not. There was joy in Abraham's house when Sarah celebrated the day of her golden wedding. But it was not to remain thus, for once more was Abraham to be tempted. He had struggled with that cunning power to which nothing is impossible, with that ever-watchful enemy who never sleeps, with that old man who outlives all. He had struggled with time, and had preserved his faith. And now, all the terror of that fight was concentrated in one moment. And God tempted Abraham, saying to him, Take now thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. All was lost then, and more terribly than if a son had never been given him. The Lord had only mocked Abraham then. Miraculously, he had realized the unreasonable hopes of Abraham, and now he wished to take away what he had given. A foolish hope it had been, but Abraham had not laughed when the promise had been made him. Now all was lost, the trusting hope of seventy years, the brief joy at the fulfillment of his hopes. Who, then, is he that snatches away the old man's staff, who demands that he himself shall break it in two? Who is he that renders disconsolate the gray hair of old age? Who is he that demands that he himself shall do it? Is there no pity for the venerable old man, and none for the innocent child? And yet was Abraham God's chosen one, 
and yet was it the Lord that tempted him. And now all was to be lost. The glorious remembrance of him by a whole race, the promise of Abraham's seed, all that was but a whim, a passing fancy of the Lord, which Abraham was now to destroy forever. That glorious treasure, as old as the faith in Abraham's heart, and many, many years older than Isaac, the fruit of Abraham's life sanctified by prayers, matured in struggles, the blessing on the lips of Abraham. This fruit was now to be plucked before the appointed time, and to remain without significance. For of what significance were it if Isaac was to be sacrificed? That sad and yet blessed hour when Abraham was to take leave from all that was dear to him, the hour when he would once more lift up his venerable head, when his face would shine like the countenance of the Lord, the hour when he would collect his whole soul for a blessing strong enough to render Isaac blessed all the days of his life, that hour was not to come. He was to say farewell to Isaac, to be sure, but in such wise that he himself was to remain behind. Death was to part them, but in such wise that Isaac was to die. The old man was not in happiness to lay his hand on Isaac's head when the hour of death came, but, tired of life, to lay violent hands on Isaac. And it was God who tempted him. Woe, woe to the messenger who would have come before Abraham with such a command! Who would have dared to be the messenger of such dread tidings? But it was God that tempted Abraham. But Abraham had faith, and had faith for this life. Indeed, had his faith been but concerning the life to come, then might be more easily have cast away all in order to hasten out of this world which is not his. But Abraham had faith and doubted not, but trusted that the improbable would come to pass. If Abraham had doubted, then would he have undertaken something else, something great and noble? For what could Abraham have undertaken but was great and noble? He would have proceeded to Mount Moriah, he would have cloven the wood and fired it and unsheathed his knife. He would have cried out to God, Despise not this sacrifice, it is not, indeed, the best I have. For what is an old man against a child foretold of God? But it is the best I can give thee. Let Isaac never know that he must find consolation in his youth. He would have plunged the steel in his own breast, and he would have been admired throughout the world, and his name would not have been forgotten. But it is one thing to be admired, and another, to be a lodestar which guides one troubled in mind. But Abraham had faith. He prayed not for mercy, and that he might prevail upon the Lord. It was only when just retribution was to be visited upon Sodom and Gomorrah that Abraham ventured to beseech him for mercy. We read in Scripture, And God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. You, whom I am now addressing, did you do likewise? When you saw the dire dispensations of providence approach threateningly, did you not then say to the mountains, Fall on me, and to the hills, Cover me? Or, if you were stronger in faith, did not your step linger along the way, longing for the old accustomed paths, as it were? And when the voice called you, did you answer, then, or not at all? And if you did, perchance in a low voice, or whispering? Not thus, Abraham, but gladly and cheerfully and trustingly, and with a resonant voice he made answer, Here am I. And we read further. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He made haste as though for some joyous occasion. And early in the morning he was in the appointed place on Mount Moriah. He said nothing to Sarah, nothing to Eliezer, his steward. For who would have understood him? Did not his temptation by its very nature demand of him the vow of silence? He laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. My listener! Many a father there has been who thought that with his child he lost the dearest of all there was in the world for him. Yet assuredly no child ever was in that sense a pledge of God as was Isaac to Abraham. Many a father there has been who lost his child. But then it was God, the unchangeable and inscrutable will of the Almighty, and his hand which took it. Not thus with Abraham. For him was reserved a more severe trial, and Isaac's fate was put into Abraham's hand together with the knife. And there he stood, the old man with his only hope, 
Yet did he not doubt, nor look anxiously to the left or right, nor challenge heaven with his prayers. He knew it was God the Almighty who now put him to the test. He knew it was the greatest sacrifice which could be demanded of him. But he knew also that no sacrifice was too great which God demanded, and he drew forth his knife. Who strengthened Abraham's arm? Who supported his right arm that it drooped not powerless? For he who contemplates this scene is unnerved. Who strengthened Abraham's soul so that his eyes grew not too dim to see either Isaac or the ram? For he who contemplates this scene will be struck with blindness. And yet, it is rare enough that one is unnerved or is struck with blindness, and still more rare that one narrates worthily what there did take place between father and son. To be sure, we know well enough, it was but a trial. If Abraham had doubted, and standing on Mount Moriah, if he had looked about him in perplexity, if he had accidentally discovered the ram before drawing his knife, if God had permitted him to sacrifice it instead of Isaac, then would he have returned home, and all would have been as before. He would have had Sarah, and would have kept Isaac. And yet how different all would have been. For then had his return been a flight, his salvation an accident, his reward disgrace, his future perchance perdition. Then would he have borne witness neither to his faith nor to God's mercy, but would have witnessed only to the terror of going to Mount Moriah. Then Abraham would have not been forgotten, nor either Mount Moriah. It would be mentioned, then, not as is Mount Ararat on which the ark landed, but as a sign of terror, because it was there Abraham doubted. Venerable Patriarch Abraham, when you returned home from Mount Moriah, you required no encomiums to console you for what you had lost, for indeed, you did win all, and still kept Isaac, as we all know. And the Lord did no more take him from your side, but you sate gladly at table with him in your tent, as in the life to come you will, for all times. Venerable Patriarch Abraham, thousands of years have passed since those times, but still you need no late-born lover to snatch your memory from the power of oblivion, for every language remembers you. And yet, do you reward your lover more gloriously than anyone, rendering him blessed in your bosom, and taking heart and eyes captive by the marvel of your deed. Venerable Patriarch Abraham, second father of the race, you who first perceived and bore witness to that unbounded passion which has but scorn for the terrible fight with the raging elements and the strength of brute creation in order to struggle with God, you who first felt that sublimest of all passions, you who found the holy, pure, humble expression for the divine madness which was a marvel to the heathen. Forgive him who would speak in your praise, in case he did it not fittingly. He spoke humbly, as if it concerned the desire of his heart. He spoke briefly, as a seemly. But he will never forget that you required a hundred years to obtain a son of your old age, against all expectations. That you had to draw the knife before being permitted to keep Isaac. He will never forget that in a hundred and thirty years, you never got farther than to faith. End of section two. Recording by Eduardo. Section three of Selections from Fear and Trembling, translated by Lee M. Hollander. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson Preliminary Expectoration An old saying derived from the world of experience has it that he who will not work shall not eat. But strange to say, this does not hold true in the world where it is thought applicable. For in the world of matter the law of imperfection prevails, and we see again and again that he also who will not work has bread to eat. Indeed, that he who sleeps has a greater abundance of it than he who works. In the world of matter, everything belongs to whosoever happens to possess it. It is thrall to the law of indifference, and he who happens to possess the ring also has the spirit of the ring at his beck and call, whether now he be Noreddin or Aladdin. And he who controls the treasures of this world controls them howsoever he managed to do so. It is different in the world of spirit. There, an eternal and divine order obtains. 
There the rain does not fall on the just and the unjust alike, nor does the sun shine on the good and the evil alike. But there the saying does hold true, that he who will not work shall not eat, and only he who was troubled shall find rest, and only he who descends into the nether world shall rescue his beloved, and only he who unsheathes his knife shall be given Isaac again. There he who will not work shall not eat, but shall be deceived, as the gods deceived Orpheus with an immaterial figure instead of his beloved Eurydice. Deceived him because he was lovesick and not courageous. Deceived him because he was a player on the Scythra rather than a man. There it avails not to have an Abraham for one's father, or to have seventeen ancestors. But in that world the saying about Israel's maidens will hold true of him who will not work. He shall bring forth wind, but he who will work shall give birth to his own father. There is a kind of learning which would presumptuously introduce into the world of spirit the same law of indifference under which the world of matter groans. It is thought that to know about great men and great deeds is quite sufficient, and that other exertion is not necessary. And therefore this learning shall not eat, but shall perish of hunger while seeing all things transformed into gold by its touch. And what forsooth does this learning really know? There were many thousands of contemporaries and countless men in after times who knew all about the triumphs of Miltilides, but there was only one whom they rendered sleepless. There have existed countless generations that knew by heart, word for word, the story of Abraham, but how many has it rendered sleepless? Now the story of Abraham has the remarkable property of always being glorious, in however limited a sense it is understood. Still, here also the point is whether one means to labor or exert oneself. Thou people do not care to labor and exert themselves, but wish nevertheless to understand the story. They extol Abraham, but how? By expressing the matter in the most general terms and saying, The great thing about him was that he loved God so ardently that he was willing to sacrifice to him his most precious possession. That is very true, but the most precious possession is an indefinite expression. As one's thoughts and one's mouth run on, one assumes, in a very easy fashion, the identity of Isaac and the most precious possession, and meanwhile he who is meditating may smoke his pipe and his audience comfortably stretch out their legs. If the rich youth whom Christ met on his way had sold all his possessions and given all to the poor, we would extol him as we extol all which is great. I would not understand even him without labor, and yet would he never have become an Abraham, notwithstanding his sacrificing the most precious possessions he had. That which people generally forget in the story of Abraham is his fear and anxiety. For as regards money, one is not ethically responsible for it. Whereas for his son, a father has the highest and most sacred responsibility. However, fear is a dreadful thing for timorous spirits, so they omit it. And yet they wish to speak of Abraham. So they keep on speaking, and in the course of their speech, the two terms, Isaac and the most precious thing, are used alternately, and everything is in the best order. But now, suppose that among the audience there was a man who suffered with sleeplessness, and then the most terrible and profound, the most tragic, and at the same time the most comic misunderstanding is within the range of possibility. That is, suppose this man goes home and wishes to do as did Abraham, for his son is his most precious possession. If a certain preacher learned of this, he would perhaps go to him, he would gather up all his spiritual dignity and exclaim, Thou abominable creature, thou scum of humanity, what devil possessed thee to wish to murder thy son? And this preacher, who had not felt any particular warmth, nor perspired while speaking about Abraham, this preacher would be astonished himself at the earnest wrath with which he poured forth his thunders against that poor wretch. Indeed, he would rejoice over himself, for never had he spoken with such power and unction, and he would have said to his wife, I am an orator, 
The only thing I have lacked so far was the occasion. Last Sunday, when speaking about Abraham, I did not feel thrilled in the least. Now, if this same orator had just a bit of sense to spare, I believe he would lose it if the sinner would reply, in a quiet and dignified manner, Why, it was on this very same matter you preached last Sunday. But, however, could the preacher have entertained such thoughts? Still, such was the case, and the preacher's mistake was merely not knowing what he was talking about. Ah, would that some poet might see his way clear to prefer such a situation to the stuff and nonsense of which novels and comedies are full. For the comic and the tragic here run parallel to infinity. The sermon probably was ridiculous enough in itself, but it became infinitely ridiculous through the very natural consequence it had. Or suppose now the sinner was converted by this lecture without daring to raise any objection, and this zealous divine now went home elated, glad in the consciousness of being effective, not only in the pulpit, but chiefly and with irresistible power as a spiritual guide, inspiring his congregation on Sunday, whilst on Monday he would place himself like a cherub with flaming sword before the man who by his actions tried to give the lie to the old saying that the course of the world follows not the priest's word. If, on the other hand, the sinner were not convinced of his error, his position would become tragic. He would probably be executed, or else sent to the lunatic asylum. At any rate, he would become a sufferer in this world. But in another sense, I should think that Abraham rendered him happy. For he who labors, he shall not perish. Now, how shall we explain the contradiction contained in that sermon? Is it due to Abraham's having the reputation of being a great man? So that whatever he does is great, but if another man should undertake to do the same, it is a sin, a heinous sin. If this be the case, I prefer not to participate in such thoughtless laudations. If faith cannot make it a sacred thing to wish to sacrifice one's son, then let the same judgment be visited on Abraham as on any other man. And if we perchance lack the courage to drive our thoughts to the logical conclusion, and to say that Abraham was a murderer, then it were better to acquire that courage, rather than to waste one's time on undeserved encomiums. The fact is, the ethical expression for what Abraham did is that he wanted to murder Isaac, the religious that he wanted to sacrifice him. But precisely in this contradiction is contained the fear which may well rob one of one's sleep. Yet Abraham were not Abraham without this fear. Or again, supposing Abraham did not do what is attributed to him, if his action was an entirely different one, based on conditions of those times, then let us forget him. For what is the use of calling to mind that past which can no longer become a present reality? Or the speaker had perhaps forgotten the essential fact that Isaac was the son. For if faith is eliminated, having been reduced to a mere nothing, then only the brutal fact remains that Abraham wanted to murder Isaac, which is easy for everybody to imitate who has not the faith. The faith, that is, which renders it most difficult for him. Love has its priests in the poets, and one hears at times a poet's voice which worthily extols it. But not a word does one hear of faith. Who is there to speak in honor of that passion? Philosophy goes right on. Theology sits at the window with a painted visage and sues for philosophy's favor, offering it her charms. It is said to be difficult to understand the philosophy of Hegel, but to understand Abraham, why that is an easy matter. To proceed further than Hegel is a wonderful feat, but to proceed further than Abraham, why nothing is easier. Personally, I have devoted a considerable amount of time to the study of Hegelian philosophy, and believe I understand it fairly well. In fact, I am rash enough to say that when, notwithstanding an effort, I am not able to understand him in some passages, it is because he is not entirely clear about the matter himself. All this intellectual effort I perform easily and naturally, and it does not cause my head to ache. On the other hand, whenever I attempt to think about Abraham, I am, as it were, overwhelmed. 
At every moment I am aware of the enormous paradox which forms the content of Abraham's life. At every moment I am repulsed, and my thoughts notwithstanding its passionate attempts cannot penetrate into it, cannot forge on the breadth of a hair. I strain every muscle in order to envisage the problem, and become a paralytic in the same moment. I am by no means unacquainted with what has been admired as great and noble. My soul feels kinship with it, being satisfied in all humility that it was also my cause the hero espoused. And when contemplating his deed, I say to myself, Jam tua kazu ajitur. I am able to identify myself with the hero, but I cannot do so with Abraham. For whenever I have reached his height, I fall down again, since he confronts me as the paradox. It is by no means my intention to maintain that faith is something inferior, but on the contrary that it is the highest of all things, also that it is dishonest in philosophy to offer something else instead, and to pour scorn on faith, but it ought to understand its own nature in order to know what it can offer. It should take away nothing, least of all fool people out of something as if it were of no value. I am not unacquainted with the sufferings and dangers of life, but I do not fear them, and cheerfully go forth to meet them. But my courage is not for all that the courage of faith, and is as nothing compared with it. I cannot carry out the movement of faith. I cannot close my eyes and confidently plunge into the absurd. It is impossible for me, but neither do I boast of it. Now I wonder if every one of my contemporaries is really able to perform the movements of faith. Unless I am much mistaken, they are, rather, inclined to be proud of making what they perhaps think me unable to do, viz. the imperfect movement. It is repugnant to my soul to do what is so often done, to speak inhumanly about great deeds, as if a few thousand of years were an immense space of time. I prefer to speak about them in a human way, and as though they had been done but yesterday, to let the great deed itself be the distance which either inspires or condemns me. Now if I, in the capacity of tragic hero, for a higher flight I am unable to take, if I had been summoned to such an extraordinary royal progress as was the one to Mount Moriah, I know very well what I would have done. I would have not been craven enough to remain at home. Neither would I have dawdled on the way, nor would I have forgot my knife, just to draw out the end of it. But I am rather sure that I would have been promptly on the spot with everything in order, in fact, would probably have been there before the appointed time, so as to have the business soon over with. But I know also what I would have done besides. In the moment I mounted my horse, I would have said to myself, Now... All is lost. God demands Isaac. I shall sacrifice him, and with him all my joy. But for all that, God is love, and will remain so for me. For in this world God and I cannot speak together. We have no language in common. Possibly one or the other of my contemporaries will be stupid enough, and jealous enough of great deeds, to wish to persuade himself and me that if I had acted thus, I should have done something even greater than what Abraham did. For my sublime resignation was, he thinks, by far more ideal and poetic than Abraham's literal-minded action. And yet this is absolutely not so. For my sublime resignation was only a substitute for faith. I could not have made more than the infinite movement of resignation to find myself and again repose in myself nor would I have loved Isaac as Abraham loved him. The fact that I was resolute enough to resign is sufficient to prove my courage in a human sense, and the fact that I loved him with my whole heart is the very presupposition without which my action would be a crime. But still I did not love as did Abraham, for else I would have hesitated even in the last minute, without, for that matter, arriving too late on Mount Moriah. Also, I would have spoiled the whole business by my behavior, for if I had had Isaac restored to me, I would have been embarrassed, 
that which was an easy matter for Abraham would have been difficult for me. I mean to rejoice again in Isaac. For he who, with all the energy of his soul, proprio moto et proprius auspicius, has made the infinite movement of resignation and can do no more, he will retain possession of Isaac only in his sorrow. But what did Abraham? He arrived neither too early nor too late. He mounted his ass and rode slowly on his way. And all the while he had faith, believing that God would not demand Isaac of him, though ready all the while to sacrifice him, should it be demanded of him. He believed this on the strength of the absurd, for there was no question of human calculation any longer, and the absurdity consisted in God's, who yet made this demand of him, recalling his demand the very next moment. Abraham ascended the mountain, and whilst the knife already gleamed in his hand, he believed that God would not demand Isaac of him. He was, to be sure, surprised at the outcome, but by a double movement he had returned at his first state of mind, and therefore received Isaac back more gladly than the first time. On this height then stands Abraham. The last stage he loses sight of is that of infinite resignation. He does really proceed further. He arrives at faith. For all these caricatures of faith, wretched, lukewarm sloth, which thinks, Oh, there is no hurry. It is not necessary to worry before the time comes. And miserable hopefulness, which says, One cannot know what will happen. There might, perhaps... All these caricatures belong to the sordid view of life and have already fallen under the infinite scorn of infinite resignation. Abraham I am not able to understand, and in a certain sense I can learn nothing from him without being struck with wonder. They who flatter themselves that by merely considering the outcome of Abraham's story they will necessarily arrive at faith only deceive themselves and wish to cheat God out of the first movement of faith. It were tantamount to deriving worldly wisdom from the paradox. And who knows, one or the other of them may succeed in doing this. For our times are not satisfied with faith, and not even with the miracle of changing water into wine. They go right on changing wine into water. Is it not preferable to remain satisfied with faith? And is it not outrageous that everyone wishes to go right on? If people in our times decline to be satisfied with love, as is proclaimed from various sides, where will we finally land? In worldly shrewdness, in mean calculation, in paltriness and baseness, in all that which renders man's divine origin doubtful. Were it not better to stand fast in the faith, and better that he that standeth take heed lest he fall? For the movement of faith must ever be made by virtue of the absurd. But note well in such wise that one does not lose the things of this world, but wholly and entirely regains them. As far as I am concerned, I am able to describe most excellently the movements of faith. But I cannot make them myself. When a person wishes to learn how to swim, he has himself suspended in a swimming belt and then goes through the motions. But that does not mean that he can swim. In the same fashion, I too can go through the motions of faith. But when I am thrown into the water, I swim. To be sure, for I am not a wader in the shallows, but I go through a different set of movements, to wit, those of infinity. Whereas faith does the opposite, to wit, makes the movements to regain the finite after having made those of infinite resignation. Blessed is he who can make these movements, for he performs a marvelous feat, and I shall never weary of admiring him, whether now it be Abraham himself or the slave in Abraham's house, whether it be a professor of philosophy or poor servant girl. It is all the same to me, for I have regard only to the movements. But these movements I watch closely, and I will not be deceived, whether by myself or by anyone else. The knights of infinite resignation are easily recognized, for their gait is dancing and bold, but they who possess the jewel of faith 
frequently deceive one because their bearing is curiously like that of a class of people hardly despised by infinite resignation as well as by faith the philistines let me admit frankly that i have not in my experience encountered any certain specimen of this type but i do not refuse to admit that as far as i know every other person may be such a specimen at the same time i will say that i have searched vainly for years for it is the custom of scientists to travel around the globe to see rivers and mountains new stars gay-colored birds misshapen fish ridiculous races of men they abandon themselves to a bovine stupor which gapes at existence and believe they have seen something worth while all this does not interest me but if i knew where there lived such a knight of faith i would journey to him on foot for that marvel occupies my thoughts exclusively not a moment would i leave him out of sight but would watch how he makes the movements and i would consider myself provided for life and would divide my time between watching him and myself practicing the movements and would thus use all my time in admiring him as i said i have not met with such a one but i can easily imagine him here he is i make his acquaintance and am introduced to him the first moment i lay my eyes on him i push him back leaping back myself i hold up my hands in amazement and say to myself good lord that person is it really he why he looks like a parish beetle but it is really he i become more closely acquainted with him watching his every movement to see whether some trifling incongruous movement of his has escaped me some trace perchance of a signaling from the infinite a glance a look a gesture a melancholy air or a smile which might betray the presence of infinite resignation contrasting with the finite but no i examine his figure from top to toe to discover whether there be anywhere a chink through which the infinite might be seen to peer forth but no he is of a piece all through and how about his footing vigorous altogether that of finiteness no citizen dressed in his very best prepared to spend his sunday afternoon in the park treads the ground more firmly he belongs altogether to this world no philistine more so there is no trace of the somewhat exclusive and haughty demeanor which marks off the night of infinite resignation he takes pleasure in all things is interested in everything and perseveres in whatever he does with the zest characteristic of persons wholly given to worldly things he attends to his business and when one sees him one might think he was a clerk who had lost his soul in doing double bookkeeping he is so exact he takes a day off on sundays he goes to church but no hint of anything supernatural or any other sign of the incommensurable betrays him and if one did not know him it would be impossible to distinguish him in the congregation for his brisk and manly singing proves only that he has a pair of good lungs in the afternoon he walks out to the forest he takes delight in all he sees in the crowds of men and women the new omnibuses the sound if one met him on the promenade one might think he was some shopkeeper who was having a good time so simple is his joy for he is not a poet and in vain i have tried to lure him into betraying some sign of the poet's detachment toward evening he walks home again with a gait as steady as that of a mail carrier on his way he happens to wonder whether his wife will have some little special warm dish ready for him when he comes home as she surely has as for instance a roasted lamb's head garnished with greens and if he met one minded like him he is very likely to continue talking about this dish with him till they reach the east gate and to talk about it with a zest befitting a chef as it happens he has not four shillings to spare and yet he firmly believes that his wife surely has that dish ready for him if she has it would be an enviable sight for distinguished people and an inspired one for common folks to see him eat for he has an appetite greater than esau's his wife has not prepared it strange he remains altogether the same again on his way he passes a building lot and there meets another man 
they fall to talking and in a trice he erects a building freely disposing of everything necessary and the stranger will leave him with the impression that he has been talking with a capitalist the fact being that the night of my admiration is busy with the thought that if it really came to the point he would unquestionably have the means wherewithal at his disposal now he is lying on his elbows in the window and looking over the square in which he lives all that happens there if it be only a rat creeping into a gutter hole or children playing together everything engages his attention and yet his mind is at rest as though it were the mind of a girl of sixteen he smokes his pipe in the evening and to look at him you would swear it was the greengrocer from across the street who is lounging at the window in the evening twilight thus he shows as much unconcern as any worthless happy-go-lucky fellow and yet every moment he lives he purchases his leisure at the highest price for he makes not the least movement except by virtue of the absurd and yet yet indeed i might become furious with anger if for no other reason than that of envy and yet this man has performed and is performing every moment the movement of infinity he has resigned everything absolutely and then again seized hold of it all on the strength of the absurd but this miracle may so easily deceive one that it will be best if i describe the movements in a given case which may illustrate their aspect in contact with reality and that is the important point suppose then a young swain falls in love with a princess and all his life is bound up in this love but circumstances are such that it is out of the question to think of marrying her an impossibility to translate his dreams into reality the slaves of paltriness the frogs in the sloughs of life they will shout of course such a love is folly the rich brewer's widow is quite as good and solid a match let them but croak the knight of infinite resignation does not follow their advice he does not surrender his love not for all the riches in the world he is no fool he first makes sure that this love really is the contents of his life for his soul is too sound and too proud to waste itself on mere intoxication he is no coward he is not afraid to let his love insinuate itself into the most secret and most remote thoughts to let it wind itself in innumerable coils about every fibre of his consciousness if he is disappointed in his love he will never be able to extricate himself again he feels a delicious pleasure in letting love thrill his every nerve and yet his soul is solemn as is that of him who has drained a cup of poison and who now feels the virus mingle with every drop of his blood poised in that moment between life and death having thus imbibed love and being wholly absorbed in it he does not lack the courage to try and dare all he surveys the whole situation he calls together his swift thoughts which like tame pigeons obey his every beck he gives the signal and they dart in all directions but when they return every one bearing a message of sorrow and explain to him that it is impossible then he becomes silent he dismisses them he remains alone and then he makes the movement now if what i say here is to have any significance it is of prime importance that the movement be made in a normal fashion the night of resignation is supposed to have sufficient energy to concentrate the entire contents of his life and the realization of existing conditions into one single wish but if one lacks this concentration this devotion to a single thought if his soul from the very beginning is scattered on a number of objects he will never be able to make the movement he will be as worldly wise in the conduct of his life as the financier who invests his capital in a number of securities to win on the one if he should lose on the other that is he is no knight furthermore the knight is supposed to possess sufficient energy to concentrate all his thought into a single act of consciousness if he lacks this concentration he will only run errands in life and will never be able to assume the attitude of infinite resignation for the very minute he approaches it he will suddenly discover that he forgot something so that he must remain behind 
The next minute, thinks he, it will be attainable again. And so it is. But such inhibitions will never allow him to make the movement, but will rather tend to let him sink ever deeper into the mire. Our knight, then, performs the movement. Which movement? Is he intent on forgetting the whole affair, which, too, would presuppose much concentration? No, for the knight does not contradict himself, and it is a contradiction to forget the main contents of one's life, and still remain the same person. And he has no desire to become another person. Neither does he consider such a desire to smack of greatness. Only lower natures forget themselves and become something different. Thus the butterfly has forgotten that it was once a caterpillar. Who knows, but it may forget altogether that it once was a butterfly, and turn into a fish. Deeper natures never forget themselves, and never change their essential qualities. So the knight remembers all, but precisely this remembrance is painful. Nevertheless, in his infinite resignation, he has become reconciled with existence. His love for the princess has become for him the expression of an eternal love, has assumed a religious character, has been transfigured into a love for the eternal being, which, to be sure, denied him the fulfillment of his love, yet reconciled him again by presenting him with the abiding consciousness of his loves being preserved in an everlasting form of which no reality can rob him. Now he is no longer interested in what the princess may do and precisely this proves that he has made the movement of infinite resignation correctly. In fact, this is a good criterion for detecting whether a person's movement is sincere or just make-believe. Take a person who believes that he too has resigned. But lo, time passed. The princess has done something on her part, for example, married a prince, and then his soul lost the elasticity of its resignation. This ought to show him that he did not make the movement correctly, for he who has resigned absolutely is sufficient unto himself. The knight does not cancel his resignation, but preserves his love as fresh and young as it was at the first movement. He never lets go of it just because his resignation is absolute. Whatever the princess does cannot disturb him, for it is only the lower natures who have the law for their actions in some other person, i.e., have the premises of their actions outside of themselves. Infinite resignation is the last stage which goes before faith, so that everyone who has not made the movement of infinite resignation cannot have faith. For only through absolute resignation do I become conscious of my eternal worth, and only then can there arise the problem of again grasping hold of this world by virtue of faith. We will now suppose the knight of faith in the same case. He does precisely as the other knight. He absolutely resigns the love which is the contents of his life, he is reconciled to the pain. But then the miraculous happens. He makes one more movement, strange beyond comparison, saying, And still I believe that I shall marry her, marry her by virtue of the absurd, by virtue of the act that to God nothing is impossible. Now the absurd is not one of the categories which belong to the understanding proper. It is not identical with the improbable, the unforeseen, the unexpected. The very moment our knight resigned himself, he made sure of the absolute impossibility, in any human sense, of his love. This was the result reached by his reflections, and he had sufficient energy to make them. In a transcendent sense, however, by his very resignation the attainment of his end is not impossible. But this very act of again taking possession of his love is at the same time a relinquishment of it. Nevertheless, this kind of possession is by no means an absurdity to the intellect. For the intellect all the while continues to be right, as it is aware that in the world of finalities in which reason rules, his love was and is an impossibility. The knight of faith realizes this fully well. Hence the only thing which can save him is recourse to the absurd, and this recourse he has through his faith. That is, he clearly recognizes the impossibility, and in the same moment he believes the absurd. For if he imagined he had faith, 
without at the same time recognizing with all the passion his soul is capable of that his love is impossible he would be merely deceiving himself and his testimony would be of no value since he had not arrived even at the stage of absolute resignation this last movement the paradoxical movement of faith i cannot make whether or no it be my duty although i desire nothing more ardently than to be able to make it it must be left to a person's discretion whether he cares to make this confession and at any rate it is a matter between him and the eternal being who is the object of his faith whether an amicable adjustment can be effected but what every person can do is to make the movement of absolute resignation and i for my part would not hesitate to declare him a coward who imagines he cannot perform it it is a different matter with faith but what no person has a right to is to delude others into the belief that faith is something of no great significance or that it is an easy matter whereas it is the greatest and most difficult of all things but the story of abraham is generally interpreted in a different way god's mercy is praised which restored isaac to him it was but a trial a trial this word may mean much or little and yet the whole of it passes off as quickly as the story is told one mounts a winged horse in the same instant one arrives on mount moriah and presto one sees the ram it is not remembered that abraham only rode on an ass which travels but slowly that it was a three days journey for him and that he required some additional time to collect the firewood to bind isaac and to whet his knife and yet one extols abraham he who is to preach the sermon may sleep comfortably until a quarter of an hour before he is to preach it and the listener may comfortably sleep during the sermon for everything is made easy enough without much exertion either to the preacher or listener but now suppose a man was present who suffered with sleeplessness and who went home and sat in a corner and reflected as follows the whole lasted but a minute you need only wait a little while and then the ram will be shown and the trial will be over now if the preacher should find him in this frame of mind i believe he would confront him in all his dignity and say to him wretch thou art to let thy soul lapse into such folly miracles do not happen all life is a trial and as he proceeded he would grow more and more passionate and would become ever more satisfied with himself and whereas he had not noticed any congestion in his head whilst preaching about abraham he now feels the veins on his forehead swell yet who knows but he would stand aghast if the sinner should answer him in a quiet and dignified manner that it was precisely this about which he preached the sunday before let us then either waive the whole story of abraham or else learn to stand in awe of the enormous paradox which constitutes his significance for us so that we may learn to understand that our age like every age may rejoice if it has faith if the story of abraham is not a mere nothing an illusion or if it is just used for show and as a pastime the mistake cannot by any means be in the sinner's wishing to do likewise but it is necessary to find out how great was the deed which abraham performed in order that the man may judge for himself whether he has the courage and the mission to do likewise the comical contradiction in the procedure of the preacher was his reduction of the story of abraham to insignificance whereas he rebuked the other man for doing the very same thing but should we then cease to speak about abraham i certainly think not but if i were to speak about him i would first of all describe the terrors of his trial to that end leech-like i would suck all the suffering and distress out of the anguish of a father in order to be able to describe what abraham suffered whilst yet preserving his faith i would remind the hearer that the journey lasted three days and a goodly part of the fourth in fact these three and a half days ought to become infinitely longer than the few thousand years which separate me from abraham i would remind him as i think right that every person is still permitted to turn about before trying his strength on this formidable task in fact that he may return every instant in repentance provided this is done 
I fear for nothing, nor do I fear to awaken great desire among people to attempt to emulate Abraham. But to get out a cheap edition of Abraham, and yet forbid every one to do as he did, that I call ridiculous. End of section 3 End of Selections from Fear and Trembling by Soren Kierkegaard Translated by Lee M. Hollander 1880-1972